Hello and welcome, Mike Riccardi. Hi there, David. Good to be with you. Good to be with you, Mike. Thank you for taking the time. Mike, before we get started, tell us everything that we need to know about you in 60 seconds. Oh, man. Uh, I think I'm a, I'm a sinner saved by grace, probably is everything you need to know. Um, I suppose if I've got 55 more seconds, I am the pastor of local outreach ministries at Grace Community Church alongside John MacArthur for the last uh, 11 years. Um, a pastor uh, or a professor of theology at the Master Seminary for the last couple of years, full time, and um, married to, to Jana, have four kids originally from central New Jersey and uh, have been out here in California for 14 years when we moved out for seminary back in uh, 2009. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Mike. So, Mike, how did you become a Christian? Um, when, well, I grew up here in the gospel thinking that I believed the gospel and, uh, you know, f recognized when I started to become a little bit more of just, you know, independent, uh, around, around 11, 12, 13, 14, that, that time where you start becoming who you're going to be. And I realized, man, um, I don't live the way that I, that I know that this, the, the scriptures say I, I ought to, I say that I'm a Christian, but, um, angry mouth is foul manipulative self-absorbed um and when i was on a uh, vacation with some extended family i was uh, we were visiting italy our family's italian american and uh, i um was like looking at some of this you know beautiful creation i was experiencing some uh, joys the joys of of sort of society and community in ways that i i hadn't and uh, just got convicted by the fact that you know i, I say i'm a christian I, I know enough to know that god gives these good things and i don't live in a way that uh, fits that i don't live in a way that answers those blessings and so i sort of sat thinking one night uh, looking up at the stars out the window of the place that i was i was uh, staying in and uh, just going you know god is is so kind to me and i am not at all concerned with him and uh, I would say that uh, at the time I thought I was going to, oh, we got to get serious about this. We've got to uh, start making faith a more important thing. But, you know, when I when I did that and started reading the scriptures and paying attention in church, it wasn't long before I realized, OK, no, what happened there was was Romans 2, 4. God's kindness was leading me to repentance really for the first time. And that it, what it means to be a, a disciple of Christ, a believer in Jesus, isn't just what you say, what you think, it's, you know, it's, it's your whole being turns from sin and, and follows after him. And so re repentance, genuine repentant faith was right around the time I was almost, almost 15. And uh, yeah, from there, started reading the scriptures, going to church, paying attention, going to the senior high youth ministry, getting discipled and, and that's where things changed. Yeah, brilliant. And how soon did you feel the call into full-time Christian ministry? Well, soon after that, I, I, start, I was reading the scriptures for the first time and going, aren't we all supposed to be itinerant ministers then? Like, I mean, isn't this just, and so I think that was the beginnings of something, you know, where I was trying to learn what it meant to follow Jesus faithfully. I, uh, I got chances because I was saved, you know, out of, you know, some, some pretty significant darkness. You know, I, I saw who I was very starkly from what I, who I ought to have been. And and so I, I was just excited. I was, you know, people use the phrase on fire. I was very much enthused with Christ. And so when people are excited about Jesus, especially young people, they give them opportunities to teach far too soon. And I got those. And um, so I started thinking, well, I'm, I'm teaching, I'm edifying people. At least I thought I was. Um, mm -hmm. And so I started thinking, like, is this something that I should be doing? Uh, and as I, but as I grew, you know, as I pressed into church and I, you know, came under the authority of elders and things like that they all would say you know that's really great but don't say that part again you know what i mean and and so i started getting i started realizing well, yeah, there's a lot to learn but i'd like to learn that and maybe i could be uh, a benefit but i recognized when i was 17 and trying to think through think through what i wanted to do in college um you know i recognized an immaturity there and i thought you know let me let me go and make sure that i can do something that i could make a living at in case if I ever decide to try to pursue becoming a pastor and for whatever reason I'm not called or I don't have that opportunity, I need to be able to support a family. So let me go 
make a, let me be able to make a living at something. And so I went to, uh, to Rutgers back. I'm from New Jersey. So I went from Rut to Rutgers university to be a, a foreign language teacher. I taught Italian. And so I did that, but in that time, college, undergrad, and I did a master's degree. During that time, I had opportunities to continue to serve in my church and growing in understanding and then and corresponding, growing in desire to, uh, to be a pastor, to be a proclaimer of the word, a minister to Christ's flock, till the point that it got to be constraining. And I sought my elders out and said, I want to go to seminary. What do you think? And they said, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. I was going to ask you what you what you would have thought you would have done if you didn't go into Christian ministry. So an Italian language teacher, right? That's what I that's what I did do. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's uh, I, I didn't grow up speaking Italian, but that trip to Italy when I, you know, sort of was arrested by the kindness of God, set me on a trajectory of studying the Italian language. There was a little bit of, you know, personal heritage and interest in that. I was always good at languages too. I had studied French well enough in a couple of years to be able to interact with some family members in Italy in French because I, they couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak Italian. So I uh, naturally, you know, God gifting me with languages and just a, a desire internally to sort of study that. I kind of looked at myself when I was almost 18 and said, well, what, what, do, I, what do I enjoy doing? And the reality is, is I enjoyed Italian and I enjoyed teaching people stuff. So I felt like, well, that's a, that's yeah. a, a place to go. I don't know if I could have done everything over again if I would have chosen to do that, but I'm glad that I'm doing this. <laughs> yeah, sure. So can you play soccer like an Italian, Mike? No, absolutely not. I, I played soccer when I was from four years old to eight years old, and I was terrible. So I uh, I took up baseball. Okay. Sure. So you've written a brand new book, which is what we're going to be talking about today, addressing a hugely important topic for whom did Christ die? Firstly, Mike, tell us how you come to write this book and then please give us an overview of what it's all about. Yeah, so the book is the fruit of my doctoral uh, dissertation research uh, here at the Master Seminary back in uh, May of 21. I completed that. And uh, soon after I finished my THM, I started reading on stuff that I wanted to read. Like when you finish a big project and it's like, OK, it's done. I can read what I want to read now. And right. I just really wanted to dig into this uh, topic, the doctrine of the extent of the atonement, you know, for whom did Christ die? And uh, I read um, the Crossway volume that had at that point recently come out uh, from heaven. He came and sought her. I'd made my way through that 700 page anthology and found myself intrigued. Uh, you know, I had a lot of folks around the master's seminary, both faculty and students have questions, raise questions about the doctrine of particular redemption and sort of, sort of, uh, you know, imply that they they could understand why it made sense maybe logically or even theologically but they struggled to accept it exegetically and um they kind of said there's this view where it's you can kind of have both and you know you can kind of have your cake and eat it too where jesus dies um in some sense for the elect alone but then jesus dies in another sense for all without exception there are multiple intentions in the atonement and they proposed, well, that's why you see a diversity of expression where some passages in scripture speak of, you know, he lays down his life for his friends and his people and his sheep and the church. And then others say that he was gave himself a ransom for all or for for uh, the whole world he was propitiation for. And so it's because it's, it's both and in different senses. And, you know, that was intriguing. And, you know, I was a pretty convinced Calvinist at the time. And so I thought, well, if that's a challenge to my view, I, would, I need to know how to answer that and help others to answer it. So I kind of dug into what was recommended to me as the best articulation of that and uh, included uh, Bruce Ware. You know, he was uh, teaching this at Southern Seminary. He had a handout that was being disseminated. And in, in my own theology class, when I was a student at seminary, that handout was was uh, presented as, what do you guys think of this? Let's talk through this view. And I thought, OK. And then I found out that not long after that, he had had a Ph.D. student do a dissertation length constructive proposal uh, fleshing out those five pages into a 300 page dissertation. So I, I got, and people were saying, this is the best stuff on this. You've got to really read this and grapple with it. So I did. And I thought, you know, I, I understand why it's attractive on the front end. Um, but I don't find when you, I think when you look under the hood, I don't find it all that convincing. I think there are several problems, both exegetically and theologically. And uh, I think that particularism, classic particular redemption, 
can be vindicated against this uh, pretty formidable um, challenge. And so I want to do that. I don't want to write anything new for my doctoral work. So I thought I'd take a shot at refuting something new. And uh, that and the book is a uh, a very lightly edited version of that doctoral dissertation. So it's it's a bit heavy. It's a bit uh, involved. Um, but I think it's written in a way that's accessible enough that if people are very interested in the topic, that they can uh, read it with profit. Yeah, well, brilliant. Much. But it's definitely a topic that we could benefit some clarity on. So appreciate the book and appreciate the conversation as well. And of course, this subject takes us to a, the, an important element of the Reformed faith, isn't it? Limited atonement. Um, help us define terms. What is limited atonement and how would you best describe the alternative view? Yeah, so... The doctrine of limited atonement sometimes is is misunderstood by its name because it, it, some people take that to mean that we're suggesting that there was something deficient in Christ's cross work. The atonement was limited some way in its internal character, in its efficacy, in what it was aiming at. And that's not what's that's not at all what it intends to do. In fact, it, it intends to safeguard all of those things, the, the sufficiency of the atonement and and its perfect efficacy you know, and, and those uh, related matters. What the limit speaks of is the extent, you know, to whom does Christ's atonement extend? And in one sense, the very simple answer to that is, well, for whom are sins atoned, right? Who goes to heaven, right? Because if you uh, don't have your sins atoned for, then the atonement was limited in some sense. Um, but some say, well, you no, know, it's not that the, the atonement was limited. It's not as if Jesus sacrificed didn't extend to all without exception it's simply that it you know having extended to all without exception not all without exception receive it and therefore their sins are not atoned for and so limited atonement says no christ died for the elect alone the ones whom the father has chosen from eternity past and given to the son the one those people christ has died for and them alone and those people the spirit will eventually regenerate and them alone um, on the other side, the uh, the sort of either general atonement or unlimited atonement or a universal atonement, they would say, no, Christ has died for all without exception. And, you know, it is up to them to receive, you know, that sacrifice. And if they don't, they don't benefit from it. But it's not the rejection, like the limitation is man's doing, not God's doing. And, uh, you know, I'm a commit, convinced, committed particularist or, or, you know, I use the term particularist as a particular redemption. Christ died for a particular people rather than generally for, for all without exception. And uh, others would say, no, it's all without exception. And then there's this the, there's always been mediating views uh, going back to the middle of the 17th century and, and before then uh, that have sort of sought to, to walk a line between them. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes you'll hear about four point Calvinism, those who agree with, uh, the T U I and P of tulip, but reject the L. Um, sometimes you'll hear hypothetical universalism. Sometimes you'll hear Amaraldianism and, uh, uh, lately you'll hear of the multiple intentions view. I think those are all mediating views, though they don't always like that. They don't like to own that language, all of them, uh, that try to have the, the best of particularism and, generalism or universal atonement um and try to kind of bring them both together i just don't think that there's any coherent way to do that and so i've tried to argue yeah. why yeah yeah one way that people may may recognize this showing up in their own churches is in a way that it's described that rather than god being sovereign over salvation he instead looks down this corridor of time to see who then chooses to come to him why is this very problematic and, and potentially dangerous mike yeah, you know, the, the doctrine of election, which is what you just moved into, is very, very, you know, uh, related, intricately related to the doctrine of atonement. I think actually taking atonement out from under the circumscription of election is what does us a lot of theological problems. Seeing that election circumscribes the atonement, right? As seeing the atonement as the outworking of the Father's eternal plan and choice and sending of the Son is key in understanding this. But if you, yeah, if, you, if you're wrong on election, if you believe that the way that God does his choosing from before the foundation of the world is to make it conditioned upon the foreseen faith or unbelief of sinners, uh, well, what that eventually does is it gives, 
that gives man reason to boast, right? If there's any basis, any ground, any condition upon which God makes his choice that's not himself but in us, then ultimately we, we have reason to say the reason that I'm saved and not my unbelieving neighbor is because I have the good sense to believe. Now, right. God foresaw that I would believe, right? You know, yeah, for sure. But still, it's it, the basis of his choice is my believing. And unless my believing is not is rooted in God's own sovereign grace, right? Unless my faith itself is a gift of God's grace, whereby he makes me to differ, then first Corinthians four, seven, who makes you to differ? Uh, you can't, you can't be, can't be asked the way that Paul intends it. He, right? he intends that answer to be, uh, you know, God makes me to differ. Nobody, I don't make me to differ, right? Well, and if you don't differ from anyone, why do you boast as if you've, you know, not been, given things freely, but that is as if you've done them yourself. Uh, a denial of unconditional election, the, the idea that God chooses who will be saved based on nothing at all in themselves, foreseen, believed, or foreseen, done, anything, but solely in his common grace, you get away from, or in his sovereign grace, solely in his special sovereign grace, you get away from that uh, you're, you're going to locate some of the reason for salvation in man, and ultimately you're going to rob God of His glory to that degree, and you're going to yeah. arrogate it to yourself. Yeah, so helpful, Mike. Thank you. Just just picking up on that. I mean, I look at my life, and I can think of so many reasons, even on a daily basis, as to why God shouldn't have chosen me. We know it's not works. How and why does God choose His elect? In the in in eternity past, you know, Ephesians one four says he you know before the foundation of the world he chose us in him to be holy and blameless in his sight. The Father, uh, looking upon the mass of humanity, considered in his own mind as already fallen, not having already fallen because they haven't been created yet, but yeah. you know, looking and recognizing that his decree is that man should be created and that man will fall into sin as a, as a, out of the desire for God to magnify the goodness of his own character through the, the salvation of sinners by his son, right? Decrees that there is a people, that there is a people who have sinned and that there is a, a, a savior to come for that sin and, and consequent upon um, the creation and fall of man in God's mind, God, as it were, looks among the, the fallen mass of humanity and says, for my own glory, uh, I choose to save this one and this one and this one and to pass by this one and this one and this one. And, and you say, on, on the basis of what? On the basis of nothing but his pure and sovereign freedom. Romans 9, 11, right? Uh, so, so that when the twins were not yet born and nothing good or bad, right? Not according to works, but according to him who calls, it was said, the older shall serve the younger. So when Paul wants to illustrate how God works in salvation, he uses the story of Jacob and Esau and says the choice of Jacob over Esau had nothing to do with the good Jacob might do or the bad Esau might do. It was not according to works. It was according to him, according to God, the one who calls, and according, so that his purpose according to election might stand, so that his electing purpose would stand. There's no, there's no basis that that is revealed to us uh, certainly but no basis other than this the free and sovereign choice of god to say i harden whom i will and i have mercy on whom i will yeah yeah so helpful you you, you mentioned that passing by as we think about limited atonement we, we we don't then have to think for too long before when considering those that god has passed by the doctrine of reprobation uh, explain that to us mike if you will well, ne necessarily, right? If if you choose some, you're not choosing others, right? Unless you choose all of a certain set, you're you're choosing some and not others. The 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 non-choice uh, of some is a choice not to save them, and so uh, that that is what the you know the the theologians have called reprobation. We see it uh, in Scripture, and it's most clearly, I think, in Romans nine. 22 uh, 20 20 to 23 really where you know god is spoken of as a potter and uh all of humanity is spoken of as vessels as clay and uh, paul tells us the potter has the right over the clay to make vessels for noble use and common use vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath 
And if the potter, if the if the clay was to ever raise itself up against the potter and say, "Why did you make me like this?" We'd think it a foolish thing. We'd think it a a, a strange and and a, sort of contrary to nature thing for the the axe to raise it, itself above the one wielding it for the 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 clay to raise itself uh, in objections uh, to the potter making it. And it, you know, it, it says there that there that that uh, yeah that that he has decided to make some to be vessels of mercy whom he has prepared beforehand for glory. And he's decided to make some vessels of wrath in whom he will display his power and justice. And, you know, that, that, uh, that decision to pass by some and not others is likewise unconditional. And then the decision to visit justice upon those whom he's passed by is conditioned upon their sin. And so, uh, it's a uh, difficult, high, mysterious doctrine, but it's the it's the flip side to election. God has chosen to save some. He's chosen not to save others. And that is itself a, a choice not to save them. And therefore, he doesn't give them to his son, right? He chose us in him yeah. before the foundation yeah. of the world, in Christ. Christ speaks in John 6 and John 10 and John 17 of those whom the Father has given me. And especially in John 17, he distinguishes those whom the father has given him from the world. He says, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but I ask on behalf of those whom you have given me. Well, when when has the father given any to the son? He's given them in eternity past when he chose those people in Christ. To, that is to say, he chose them to be he chose them to be his own and he chose to give them to Christ and for Christ to be their mediator. Well, if he's chosen them to be Christ's and Christ to be their mediator, then he's not chosen others. Well, then he didn't give those to Christ, and therefore Christ does not die for them. He dies for those whom the Father has given him. Yeah, really helpful, Mike. Thank you. I know you've spent years looking at me, so I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on some of the the Bible verses that would on, would on first reading push back against limited atonement, and I'm sure we'll find their way into the the comments of our interview today as well. So let's start off with First Timothy chapter two verse six. What did Paul mean when he said that Christ gave Himself as a ransom for all? Yeah, so uh, I think one of the one of the main arguments of the book, in fact, I think the main argument of the book is that it's a it's a methodological mistake to focus too quickly on an extent language to the exclusion of nature of atonement language. So, you know, what you have in that passage is you have, you know, Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all. What does it mean before we, we, we answer the question who all is, what's the extent of that, the scope of that? Let's answer the question of substance. What is that? What does it mean to give oneself a ransom for? Right. Let's define ransom and uh, biblically, right? And then say, okay, given what the atonement is by nature, uh, can we make any deductions upon what the extent ought to be? And the reality is, in, in, first of all, interestingly, right, you get a, a, a sentence almost identical in Mark 10, 45 or Matthew 20, 28, right? The Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So almost an identical statement to give himself a ransom for all, to give his life a ransom for many. And all and many are the opposite, you know, uh, scopes, opposite alternatives for extent. And so you say, well, how do I decide which one it is? Right. Well, it's both in the sense that each author intended it. Um, And the question is, do we get any clues as to what that is? Well, if you understand what a ransom is, that in scripture, a ransom is the payment of a price to secure the release of captives, right? Then you have to ask yourself if Jesus is characterizing his atoning work as the payment of a price designed to release the captives. One way we could answer the question, for whom has this ransom been given, is we could say, you know, is to answer is to answer the question and answer it by the effect that it's had. Whose who, who are actually delivered from captivity by the payment of this ransom price? Do we all agree that there are some who perish in their sins and therefore are not freed from captivity to sin? There, that there are some who perish eternally in hell 
like Jesus says, that the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many find it. So if, if there are some who are not released from that captivity, it, can we properly say that Christ has paid the ransom price for them? If so, what's happened? Has he failed? If the ransom price is paid in order to release people from captivity and they're not released eventually, has Christ failed at what he's done? I think you wind up having to say yes if you say that the ransom was for all and not all are freed from it. But the scripture doesn't give us a category for, for ransom payment that is ineffective. Anywhere you see a ransom price being paid, you see the captive going free. Anytime you speak of redemption, the slave goes out of his captivity. And so, therefore, we have to ask, well, if Christ is a ransom for all, according to Paul, why aren't all ransomed? And then the question becomes, well, is there any sense of all that makes sense in that passage other than all without exception? Everybody in history who's ever lived in the face of the earth. And, and the answer is, yeah, the context gives us actually good reason to have not have not a not absolutely universal interpretation of the term all in First Timothy 2 6. And it starts in First Timothy 2 1, where Paul urges prayers and petitions be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority. Now, let's let's ask the question: is Paul intending to enjoin upon the church of Ephesus prayer meetings? for every single individual who has ever lived on the earth in history without exception, or even every individual alive on the earth at that time. No, I don't think he is. I think that would require virtual omniscience, even if it was only the people alive at that time. You know, I mean, they were in Ephesus, but did they know Was there, did they know the people in China? They, when they said, well, well, no, it just means everybody kind of in general. Well, well, no, because your argument is ransom for all. is isn't just everybody in general. It's for every single individual who's ever lived without history. So it all in verse six needs to needs to match up with all in verse one. And and so, well, what does it mean then? Well, verse two comments on what all means, comma, king for kings and all who are in authority. In other words, Paul is giving different classes of people, right? He's speaking of, I want you to pray for all people. Yeah, Paul, but not like Caesar who wants to kill us, right? No, no, no. Even for kings and all who are in authority that we might live a tranquil and quiet life and we'd be able to, to flourish in the preaching of the gospel and not trouble anybody or have anybody trouble us. These kings and uh, uh, persons of authority who you would just as soon see as your enemy and may decide not to bless with the the you know the praying for them you need to pray for them so that uh we would we would have uh, an easy go of things and that we wouldn't be persecuted and we could then the work of the gospel could go on and uh you know i think that that fits uh the context therefore he means all kinds of people all classes of people without distinction rather than all individuals without exception yeah yeah Really, also, Mike, Christ, really, Christ really helpful. Answer for all sorts of people. Yeah. yeah, really helpful. In Peter's second letter, he said that the law does not wish for any to perish. How do we reconcile that with limited atonement? Well, in, in the same way we would re reconcile it with a limited election, right? I mean, you know, ultimately, who decides who gets saved? Is it is it sinners or is it the Savior? Is it man or is it God? You know, when, jo when Jonah says salvation is of the Lord, when God says, I'm, I am Yahweh, I'm in the heavens, I do all that I please. I, I'm the alone declaring the ends from the beginning. I do all my good pleasure. When Daniel says no one can thwart your, your purpose and, and uh, all the nations are like a drop in the bucket and you do according to your will in the host of heaven. Um, what, do all the, what do all those things mean? What would it mean for a God who does all of his good pleasure to be sovereign over all things, who works all things after the counsel of his own will, Ephesians 1.11, to want something that doesn't happen. Well, obviously, there's a sense in which he wants it. Otherwise, Peter wouldn't say it in 2 Peter 3.9. Um, or, or, or there's a better interpretation of 2 Peter 3.9. And I, I would argue that um, the best interpretation of 2 Peter 3.9 is to ask, when, when Peter says, not wishing for any, to come to, to to perish, but for all to come to a knowledge of the truth. The question is, 
how would that demonstrate God's patience? The Lord, in the previous verse, 2 Peter 3, 8, it says, And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise toward you. So direct address, second person, to the people that Peter is writing to. Um, knowing that with the day with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day, and he's not he, he's not wishing for any to, to perish, but all to come to knowledge of the truth. How is how is it a demonstration of God's patience toward the recipients of Peter's letter for him to uh, forestall his coming and desire that all would be saved? Well, who's the you? In verse one of Second Peter three, he he says it's the second letter that I'm writing to you. And in verse 1 of chapter 1, when he addresses them, he speaks of them as the ones who he's written to before. And the, the addressees of the first letter of Peter are to those who are chosen of God, spread apart as aliens throughout Pontus, Galatia, Bithynia, Cappadocia, and so on. Peter is writing, he calls them beloved in, in three one which is a designation to refer to believers, Peter is writing to the churches in those areas, the, those who he speaks with, according to the judgment of charity, as, as believers. And he's saying, there are some of you, the sheep of the Lord's pasture, whom he has chosen to bring to himself, but who have not yet repented of their sins, and turn to Jesus in faith. Christ himself says this kind of thing in John 10, 16, where he says, verses after he says, I lay my life down for the sheep. He says, I have other sheep also, not of this fold. I must bring them in. Jesus says, I presently have those people. Not I will get them, but I have them by donation from my father from eternity past because he's given them to me. And I'll eventually, through the word of these disciples, I will bring them into the fold as well. So there is a, such a thing as elect unbelievers. There are people who have been chosen by God for salvation, but who have not yet come to faith. And what Peter is saying is God delays the coming of Christ so that all whom he has chosen, all of you, all of the elect, all of the Lord's flock will repent of their sins and all will be brought home because God does not want to lose any of the sheep that he has given to the son. No one will snatch them out of his hand. And if Christ was to come back now, while they're yet in unbelief, he'd have to destroy those whom Christ has purchased and whom he's chosen. And he's not going to do that. He wants all of the ones he's chosen to come to repentance. So good, Mike. All about context, isn't it? Context, context, context. And this has a real practical application as well for believers because this has an impact on evangelism. I don't know what it's like for where you are, Mike, but over here in the UK, it's popular for some people to go around um, telling everybody that God loves them and has a great plan for their life. Why is this really dangerous? Well, uh, for one thing, the scriptures never represent our evangelistic practice that way, right? You, you'll search in vain for an apostle or a, a disciple or anybody in the New Testament, really, or Old Testament to speak to an unbeliever and declare the gospel to them or call them to faith by and starting out by saying God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Um, I, I certainly affirm the universal beneficence and um, benevolence of God. You know, in that sense, God loves him. He does good to all his creatures. His mercies are over all his works. But the love of complacency, the delight that is usually intended by a, a statement like that. God loves you. He thinks you're wonderful. Yeah. He, his heart yearns to have you and those sorts of things. That's just simply not true, right? God does not take delight in those which he has decided not to make his own and to leave to their deserved destruction. There, you know, Before salvation, there's nothing to delight in any uh, sinner. The only reason that God loves any of us is because he has uh, recreated us in the image of his son and made us to look like himself, right? He loves what is lovely and he alone is, is lovely. And so it's you know, certainly that act of love to, to save us, to send Christ for us. That love is, is in Christ, but that love is, is limited to those who are in Christ. And uh, that is not all without exception. Secondly, it, you know, this notion that, you know, not just God loves you, but but Christ died for you. God sent his son to die for you. So you need to believe in him. Well, again, you'll search in vain for any expression of evangelism, whether by precept or example in the book of Acts and the epistles. 
where that's where that's how the apostles preach the gospel. They don't say Jesus died specifically and personally for you because he's died for everybody without exception. And therefore, because he's died for you, you have to respond to that and believe in him. No, they say the promised Messiah has come. They say sinners have been atoned for. They say uh, Christ has accomplished the salvation of his people. And if you repent and trust in him, you will have been among that number. You know, you, you will be right. then counted among that number as, as his people. You'll know that you were one of the ones he's done this for because part of the fruit of him having done it is their trusting in him and repenting of sin. So, um, I, you know, and, and frankly, if Christ has died for all without exception, right? And many of those for whom he's died have gone to hell like Judas, like Pharaoh, like Jezebel, right? Uh, what comfort should it be that that uh, to, to tell anybody that Christ has died for them, right? Because if Christ can die for me and people still, and I can still go to hell, it doesn't really matter that Christ has died for me. The proclamation now becomes, now here's what you need to do, right? Because here's what you need to do to distinguish yourself from the people Christ has died for and have perished versus the ones that Christ has died for and don't perish. Now, now whose burden is salvation? Upon whose shoulders is that is my salvation thrust? It's not upon what Christ has accomplished. It's what I do in response. And when you when you say that, you, you don't always people don't always admit it. But when you say that, you wind up saying, Christ saves us with our help. And J.I. Packer makes the point in his very famous introduction to John Owen's Death and Death and the Death of Christ. He makes the point that when you really tease that out, Christ saves us with our help, what you really mean is we save ourselves with Christ's help. And it really is a co-savior, a sharing of glory, a denial of grace alone, and uh, you get an impoverished gospel. Now, I, I'm not saying every every believer in unlimited atonement uh, denies the gospel. I'm saying that uh, people are inconsistent with themselves all the time. We hold positions that, if we were to be consistent, would lead us into heresy. But because of our blessed inconsistency, keeps us away from that. So I want to be charitable and, and kind to my brothers who fall on the other side of this matter. When people say, you know, but is this a gospel issue? Is the extent of the atonement a first order issue? My, my response is always, it can be. It doesn't have to be, but it can be. Because, because if you were to remain consistent with, with uh, the concept of a universal atonement that doesn't save everybody it's offered for, you wind up, to, I think, denigrating the efficacy of that atonement. You say that it is not effective, Christ fails of his intention, and ultimately the burden for salvation is placed back on the sinner. And that's not good news. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've spoken about limited atonement. We've spoken about evangelism. You put those two things together and there's a ditch that you can fall into, isn't there, which is known as hyper-Calvinism. How can we avoid falling into that ditch? And just explain briefly what that is, Mike, if you would. Yeah, hyper-Calvinism embraces a number of ideas, but one of the, the most important is uh, since God has chosen some and not all, uh, and since Christ has died for some and not all, therefore we ought not to proclaim the gospel except to some and not all. Then you say, well, which ones? And they say, well, those showing signs of election. You say, well, what, what are those? Spurgeon famously said, you know, they got like a, an E on their shirt tag or something. Right. No, they would say contrition and, um, you know, mourning over their sin and being humbled by the law and these sorts of things. And there have been historical movements that said, yeah, you don't you don't preach the full and free offer of the gospel to all without exception. You preach the free offer of the gospel to only those who are showing such signs of election. I think the scriptures uh, don't give us any warrant for that. Right. In, in the in the chapter, uh, Isaiah 53, right, where the servant is said to have poured out his blood, for the, you know, for the for the many. Right. To be justified, to justify the many um, uh, to uh Pierced, pierced for our transgressions, Israel says at the end of their, at the end of time, as they repent and trust in Messiah, Zechariah twelve ten. Two chapters later, in Isaiah fifty five, you get the call: "Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters." And in Romans nine, you have the clearest statement of sovereignty and salvation that you ever have. It does not depend on man who wills or man who runs, but on God who has mercy. So then he has mercy and he wills, and he hardens and he wills. And then in chapter 10, 
21, it says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient, godless, or uh, obstinate people. God's stretching out his hands saying, come to me, right? right? And in Matthew 11, Jesus says, I praise you, Father, for hiding things from the wise and intelligent and revealing them to babes. For yes, for this way in your sight was well-pleasing. Nobody knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So the, I mean, Jesus says, the only way you know God is if I show him to you. And then says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So the, these statements of utter and absolute particularism, these only, right? The, the many, you know, God d decides this. You've hidden these things are followed up right in the same contexts with these indiscriminate appeals to come and be saved. And so, you know, true biblical Calvinism has always been what's called a uh, compatibilist or, or a concurrent, uh, I understand the doctrine of concurrence, that, that man is both at the same time responsible to come and God is sovereign over who comes. And so we would, we would make it a rationalistic imposition upon the text of scripture if we were to say, since election is particular and atonement is particular, therefore the free offer of the gospel is particular. Would that, no, that doesn't follow biblically. We would have to say at this at once, at once at the same time, election is particular, the atonement is particular, but the, the call of the gospel is indiscriminate. It goes out to everyone. And the, and the canons of the Senate of Dort held that from the beginning of when there might have been a thing called Calvinism or the points of Calvinism, right? At the same time as affirming a particular redemption under the second head of doctrine in the canons of the Senate of Dort, at the very same time, it says that gospel must be preached to all promiscuously, and all of those who are called are seriously called, genuinely, uh, well-meant uh, offer uh, from God to all without, all without uh, exception. And you say, well, how, that doesn't make sense to me. Well, that's fine. You don't have to understand everything, but you do have to accept what the scripture says plainly. And it says plainly that God chooses some and not others plainly that Christ dies for his own whom the Father has given him, and not all without exception, and that we ought to publish that gospel promiscuously to all that we can come in contact with. Yeah, yeah, really good. Mike, you've had a front row seat in observing John MacArthur's ministry over the last few years. Firstly, what is your greatest memory of working with John? And secondly, how do you guys go about replacing someone like John MacArthur when that day comes? Okay, so memory. I think there's, I mean, there's so many things you could say, um, you know, just the sort of the humble interactions, you know, where he comes, seeks you out, shakes your hand, tries to encourage you. Um, you know, those are very sweet. There was a time, uh, one time at his house where he had a, a several of the elders over and we had dinner in the backyard and then, you know, seeing his home study and kind of where he, you know, where the magic happens, you know, um, you know, those are big. I think, for me, you know, I got a, uh, the immense privilege of working with him on the later stages of uh, the book, Biblical Doctrine, the systematic theology that we put out. And uh, just some of those, some of those phone conversations where, uh, you know, he's given us a draft. I've then massaged it. We've put things together, sent it back to him. He's made edits and we're talking through all of that. I remember one time as I sat in this chair late one night, we were talking through how to best represent the, the doctrine of, you know, representative headship, you know, how, how we inherit the guilt of Adam's sin and not just his corruption. And uh, just hashing through doctrinal matters with John MacArthur on the phone, um, that's something that I won't ever forget. And it's because it's a substantive conversation. It's, it means the most. Maybe one other thing worth mentioning is when I, uh, my wife and I tried for six years to have kids and couldn't, and when we finally had them, had twins. And uh, there were health complications, especially with uh, one of them. And um, seeing uh, Pastor John and, and, pa and Mrs. MacArthur, Pat MacArthur, come to the hospital and see them with these like preemie babies and being able to take pictures of them. My son's name is John. And so being able to take a picture of John holding John and, and then Olivia also, uh, as she was dealing with some, some really serious health complications, uh, was just, that was a sweet time to have, you know, 
want the greatest preacher in our generation be your pastor and just kind of be there with you in a time where you needed it. Yeah, great stuff. And and this is probably an even harder question, maybe the hardest question I've asked oh, you, you asked today. Me something else though. Was yeah, how do you there? guys go about replacing? Oh, replacing John MacArthur yeah. one day. Well, you don't. You know, the reality is, is you know, whoever it's going to be is not going to be him, and that's going to disappoint a lot of people. And so, I think we are all recognizing of that. But I think the way that you I mean the way that he tells it is, you know, when you have your hand in a bucket of water and you pull out your hand and there's no hole left in the water, he says that's what it'll be like. None, none of us is expendable or is in inexpendable we're all you know the lord builds his church but I, I think you know the goal here is to honor his legacy by honoring the word right like preaching the same word and watching it do its work according to the pleasure of god uh in the same way as when it was him doing it right it's never been about a man except the man christ jesus and it's been about the right. word of god and you know what pastor john has done is he's faithfully preached that word for 50 plus years and you know, if we can insist with ourselves that our job is to preach the same word, then perhaps God will be pleased to, to continue blessing this place. You know, and uh, if we if we get off course of that, you know, I think that'll that'll mess things up. But if you if you just you train the people to recognize, you know, he he himself, Pastor John himself would have us have you know, insist that it's not about him, but about the word. And so if you can you've bled with Wallace now bleed with me kind of a thing. You know, you've, you've, you've labored faithfully under John MacArthur for all these years. Now as the elders, you know, eventually, and we're not talking about tomorrow, we're talking about years from now already. Um, yeah. You know, eventually when that time comes, will you commit to standing with, with us the way that you have uh, when, when we've been led so well um, and then who will, who will eventually fill that role? I think the elders want, to have a rotation of guys, you know, sort of fill that uh, role for the first little while so that everybody kind of gets used to the idea that John's not going to come back and, uh, and that we're what you've got. <laughs> and, and then eventually I think the elders will make a decision as to, you know, which of those guys or maybe even someone else, um, yeah. you know, occupies that role full time. And, and whoever that guy is, will need a lot of help, a lot of support. And m my desire is to see the people of Grace Church, served well and ministered to and cared for in a very what is a potentially turbulent uh, difficult time you know because you just love somebody so much and you're used to them for so long and not not that there will be unnecessary turbulence but just when that happens it's a it's a time of transition and you just my, my great heart is i want to care for those people during that transition and, and uh, god will god will raise up who it is next yeah yeah brilliant one well, Mike, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. We're about to take a very well, Mike, quick thank break. you so much for your time. Before we let you go, and um, please take a moment to, to let us know your closing thoughts and also let people know how they can follow you on social media. What was well, my closing thoughts are this. Um, nobody, at least they shouldn't, I, myself, and those who I'm close with, don't insist upon the doctrine of particular redemption because we want to be exclusionary, right? Because we want to say, well, Christ hasn't died for all people and that might not include you. So you just kind of move over there. That's, that's not the goal at all. The goal is to safeguard the achievements of Christ's cross from being emptied of their power, of being emptied of what makes them precious and powerful to save us. I don't need an atonement that makes me redeemable or makes my sins propitiable, right? Or, you know, God potentially satisfied with me. I need an atonement. I don't need an atonement that reconciles me in such a way as I can perish in the lake of fire eternally. And, and all of these guys who, who promote this particular view that I was um, writing against, the view that I think is the best wrong view, say... There's a redemption that doesn't pay the price. There's a propitiation that leaves God angry with you. There's a reconciliation that could leave you alienated with him, from him from eternity. And there's an expiation that lets you perish in your guilt. And look, the reality is, is I don't need that kind of atonement. I need the atonement that saves me, that propitiates the Father's wrath, that bears my guilt away, that reconciles me to him in such a way as I am with him forever, never to be alienated, never to be uh, parted from him and that then that really frees me from the captivity of sin and death 
And the only kind of atonement that does all of those things perfectly is the kind of atonement that is particular. Because again, if Jesus does those things for all people and not all people are saved, then, the, then something other than the atonement is the definitive cause of salvation. And I don't trust my response. I don't trust right. my good sense of yeah. believing or receiving a gift. I'm depraved. My mind is, a, is, is darkened. My heart is stone. My throat's an open grave, right? The poison of asps is under my lips. I will never make that decision. I need a salvation that gets me all the way home, that, that right. frees me from captivity. And so, look, you might have, you, it might sound noble and magnanimous to say, Christ died for everybody, and you're, and you're just welcomed to all of this. But if, if what he's died for isn't bringing you all the way home, then it doesn't matter that he's died for you. But if I have an atonement that is not, is, whose greatness is measured not by its breadth, but by its efficacy, by its, its ability, by its power to accomplish all that it intends, then even though it might not bring everybody to heaven, it brings everybody it was accomplished for to heaven. And that's right. good news. That's the one, that's the salvation, that's the atonement that I need. And I want to protect the efficacy of, of the cross of Christ from being drained of its power by what is, you know, by unwittingly uh, trying to universalize its extent in what feels like a magnanimous move, but unwittingly empties of it, empties it, it of its power and glory. So that, that's why we write this book. That's why, uh, you know, we, we labor on this issue. We want to see Christ get what he's worthy of and preserve the integrity of the work of salvation. Amen. And then if you want more of me, uh, you can look for me on Twitter. I think it's at Mike Riccardi underscore and uh, Facebook, you know, same, same name. You'll see the same picture. Um, my, uh, yeah, I think that's probably good. Yeah. Well, what I'm going to do, Mike, is I'm going to find the links by Twitter and Facebook and to the book as well. And I'll make sure that they're in the description, wherever you're listening or watching this interview, make sure that you go and follow Mike and, and buy the book as well. It's going to be a real help to you. Mike, thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate speaking to you today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you, David.